So, welcome back to sociological theory. Um, today we are, or this week, <clears throat> we're going to be discussing critical race theory and intersectionality. Um, this particular, actually, let me do something. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to be discussing critical race theory and intersectionality. Um, October 18th was an instructional day. Um, so you didn't have to check for any classes or anything like that. If you had something to upload, something due, then, you know, obviously that, that was important. But um, in terms of having to look at a lecture or anything, you didn't have to look at anything. So this is enough information that would last for you know, let's say the 18th and the 22nd. Um, so if you do watch this on the 18th, that's fine, but I'm not expecting you to watch this until the, the 20th for the 20th and the 22nd. So um, I think this is an important, um, a very important topic. And I guess I probably should have went over this early on, uh, but I kind of like to do things in a, you know, again, I, I have a, background in history. So I, I always think of things from a from a chronological standpoint. I always like to do things in a chronological standpoint and tell the story as it happens historically. And so um, at, if you notice, we've been dealing with a lot of theories for the first part of the semester that have been more in readings that have been more um, that have dealt with the foundation of sociology, right? Obviously we've applied it to, you know, newer conversations, more relevant conversations. Um, we've talked about, you know, more relevant themes, more modern ideas around sociology, but it's been kind of rooted and grounded in some of our um, classical texts. Um, but now we're getting ready to, and if you notice in the syllabus, we're getting ready to read and engage with some readings and some sources that are a little bit more up to date, a little bit more modern. And then as we get to the end of the semester, we'll even um, engage with music and artists and, you know, you know, rap and, and, and art and, you know, things like that. So, um, so that is what we are, that is what we're getting ready to, uh, to do now. So critical race theory uh, is that thing, obviously you probably came into this semester, you know, knowing about the backlash with critical race theory, because that was a big thing um, over the summer and getting students ready for the fall, not only, not just college students, but high school students as well. Um, and this was a, a, a huge pushback. By a, certain, by a certain sector of the American population or of the US population who believed that critical race theory was uh, a framework, an educational framework and a, uh, a critical discourse that was harmful to US students, particularly K through 12, but even on the college level. And so I've kind of waited and we've talked about it a little bit earlier, so we won't go into all of it, but we're gonna go deeper into it today um, and talk more about it today. And then even a, then show where this critical analysis actually comes from. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that now. So going to the second slide of your, um, of your PowerPoint, uh, going to the second slide, the question is, what do people believe critical race theory is? Okay, so the question isn't, what is critical race theory? What do people think it is, right? Because a lot of times what things are actually doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, that typically does not get the headlines. Is usually what people think something is. Right. There's a there's a quote that is said by a, a cultural influencer, if you will, 
Charlemagne the God, if any of you ever, you know, listen to the Breakfast Club or or watch or or watch the Breakfast Club. And he always says, nobody wants to hear the truth if the lie is more interesting. Meaning, um, and he's talking about more popular culture and headlines and clicks. Nobody really cares about what really happened as long as the headline is something that makes you want to read the story. And even if you read the story and there's, there's nowhere near the truth, eh, but I like the lie. It was more entertaining. So no one, I know he says no one wants to hear the truth when the lie is more entertaining. Right. Um, I think somebody said there's another, I don't think this is his quote, but I've heard a quote that a lie can go around the world three times before the truth has enough time to get out to uh, to get out of the driveway, meaning a lie travels way faster than the truth can. And so, and typically, and lies are not always people who are purposely um, giving false information about something. Sometimes a lie is just a false assumption, right? It's just something is when you think something is one thing, but it's not. So sometimes lies are just, it can just be false assumptions. And so that's why we're starting with that with critical race theory, not necessarily what it is. If you're in this class, then more than likely you have an idea about critical race theory. If you take an intro, you know what critical race theory is. Um, and even if you don't, you're probably, if you're a sociologist, more than likely you're a proponent of critical race theory. I don't know too many sociologists who aren't. Um, so kind of preaching to the choir here. So I don't I don't feel I have to necessarily teach you or convince you that critical race theory is important. But I do think it is important to look at the other side, even if it's a side that we don't necessarily agree with. Still a side that has uh, or believes a certain thing. And so it's important to know what is the discourse, what is going on outside of our silos about this topic, about this concept that is making people feel a certain way. A lot of times people disagree with our positions or with your positions or you know, with any position, many times because they might just be misunderstood. They may not know entirely what a person believes or what a person thinks or what something is. Now, sometimes they do and they still disagree and that's okay, but at least they've been informed. But a lot of these ideas around critical race theory, especially those who oppose it, oppose it because many times they're just misinformed and they don't have an idea as to what it really is and what it really does. So what I would like for you to do is I would like for you to click on this link. I really, really wish we can kind of look at this um, together or at the very least, I could share it with you and then watch it with you, but I've already watched it. So I want you to click on this link. It's so about a 10 minute um, look at the different views around critical race theory. And then, um, then we're gonna come back and we're gonna discuss some of these assumptions about it. All right. <clears throat> so what is critical race theory, right? That's the question. And we'll get into that in a second about what it, actually is. The important question right now, I think, is what it is not saying. In looking at this link, think about some of the things that these people or different people believe critical race theory was. So think about what it is, what you already know. And again, we're going to go over that. But then also think about what people believe it is before we go into these assumptions, right? You had this woman that said, we don't wanna be taught that we should hate America. We wanna teach diversity and that everybody is important. We don't want white people to feel like, like they should come down on themselves. We don't want America to be looked at as a bad place. 
right? All of these different ideas and assumptions that were kind of brought out. We wanted to make sure that we promote meritocracy. Getting to a certain place because of your works, not because of your race or your gender or your sex or your ethnicity or whatever. So these are the things that people believe critical race theory does, right? So what we want to do is we want to dispel some myths about what it is not. Critical race theory, number one, is not saying that white people are evil. Some people believe, especially when they hear um, rhetoric from people of color, particularly black people, um, because I think the biggest tension with white people in the United States obviously is, is black people. Black people have had the, 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 the longest running tension with white people in, in America, right? Um, well, and Native Americans, for sure, yeah. Um, so yeah, black people and Native Americans have definitely had the longest running issue with the United States. And so oftentimes when people of color and more specifically black people criticize white people or criticize America or bring a critical analysis from a racial perspective, whether it's a overt idea or a covert idea, there is this notion in a lot of white people that this person must think white people are evil white people are bad, <clears throat> white people are the devil, right? And this dates back to some rhetoric within the black resistance tradition that have openly said white people are the devil or white people are evil or, you know, blue eyed devil, right? That was, uh, Malcolm X actually was quoted as saying some of these things, right? These are some of the things that he was taught when he was with the organization that he was with, the Nation of Islam. And at that particular time, Malcolm X had learned a lot from reading a lot of books, learning history, coming up with a critical analysis for himself. And with everything that he had experienced with white people, whether it be him being told that he wouldn't be anything in life, but a janitor from a white teacher that he really liked all the way up until, uh, until his father who was killed by the Klan and his body was split in half because he was tied to a, a railroad track um, while he was still alive. Um, his mother being put in an insane asylum because of racism and poverty that she had been dealing with all her life. So all these different things that had happened to him and someone finally connecting the dots and showing him all of these, who, who was the source of all of this pain? And when he, when he felt that he came to the realization that it was white people, this is when he began to form uh, a disdain, not necessarily for white people because of their skin, but for white people because of what they had done to him in his life. And so that rhetoric is really the first time in which we get in the Black, I think, nationalist tradition, the Black resistance tradition in the United States of this idea, this popularized idea of white people being the devil, right? Um, and so, and because of the popularity of Malcolm X and his development and, and advancement over time and his world, his influence across the world, a lot of people have honed in on that, specifically white people who are focused on revisionist history, kind of hone in on that. And now they're afraid that that rhetoric will then reappear, right? With people who have these so-called radical views, specifically people of color or black people, that have these radical views and say, oh, they're saying we're the devil again, oh, they're saying white people are evil. So with critical race theory, even though there's nothing to suggest in any research, published 
research or from the founders of critical race theory that say that it is um, that they promote this idea that white people are evil or are the devil. Now, anything that is extremely critical of white people's be behaviors or practices within the US historical context, the negative practices, anything that is very critical of that and challenges that is typically seen as being as radical as saying white people are evil. Uh, but critical race theory does not do that. Critical race theory does not say minorities should oppress other groups. This is something that was popular during the apartheid era, where, and I, I mean, this wasn't the first time, this, is, this actually dates back to slavery, where white people oftentimes were afraid to stop oppressing black people because deep down inside, they knew um, what they were doing was wrong. And if they were ever in that position, um, <coughs> if they were ever in that position, um, they know that if they had the opportunity to rise, they would want to retaliate. Any human being would want to retaliate against a group of people who had been oppressing them, who had been responsible for their degradation, who had been responsible for their ancestors being killed, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is historical research. This isn't anything that's that's being made up. Uh, even if you watch the movie on Nelson Mandela's life, um, one of the um, fears that South that white South Africans had about ending apartheid was because they said, you all outnumber the Africans, outnumber the Afrikaans. The Africans outnumber the white South Africans. So even though the white South Africans are the ones in power, the black South Africans have the numbers. And if we free them, if we give them the opportunity to really express and they become emboldened, they could easily overtake us just by the sheer numbers. And they were very much afraid because they said if this was the opposite, we would probably do the same thing. And so Nelson Mandela had to assure these white South Africans that that was not the case. But that's something they was afraid, of, that they were afraid of. So this is not a new idea, right? And so um, this idea that minorities should oppress other groups, is this belief or a part of the part of the um, part of white fragility, uh, which I don't know if we go into white fragility, but uh, if you ever read what was her name, who wrote that book? Uh, I forgot. But um, this is a really good book uh, called White Fragility. If you're interested in this topic, you should read it. And sometimes I teach out of it in my intro class. Um, but oh, I forgot the lady's name. Uh, but she was on. I think she was on like the the Tonight Show. Oh no, she was on the show with um, South African guy who's a comedian. Name Trevor Noah, the show that Trevor Noah does. I believe she was on that show. Um, but anyway, white fragility. So this is a part of white fragility, and it's the white guilt that a lot of white people feel when being confronted with the idea of actually loosening the reins of discrimination, loosening the chains of injustice on people of color with the fear that they would, if, if they have enough power, they will retaliate. Uh, so minorities oppressing other groups is something that a lot of people believe critical race theory does. Some people believe critical race theory promotes hate and a hatred for America because critical race theory suggests that racism is systemic and structurally a part of the American foundation. So they said, wow, you're, you're encouraging people to hate America. You're encouraging people to say that America is inherently racist. And the first part isn't true, but the second part is. The second part is saying that America is inherently racist. And there, there are mountains of documents to prove it. But the first part is false in that it is not saying that a person should hate America. At least that's what not, that is not what critical race theory does. <clears throat> now, if you have certain people, individuals who may believe that, 
<clears throat> that's on the individual. But the theory itself is not suggesting that people should hate America. It is suggesting that people should critique America and tell the truth about America. Um, and then lastly, that white people should hate themselves. So what people believe critical race theory does, they believe it's almost reverse discrimination. They believe that it does the, the opposite of what Jim Crow did. Um, what, um, why am I so bad with names? What um, Kenneth and Mamie Walker did in the 1930s, they did a doll test. You may have heard about this. This doll test was done to show the effects of, of segregation on children. And what they did was they took a white doll and they took a black doll and they would put it in front of a little black girl and they would say, which doll is the prettiest? And more often than not, the black girl will pick up the white, the white doll. Which doll is the smartest? They will pick up the white doll. Which doll is the bravest? Pick up the white doll. Which doll do you want to be like? Pick up the white doll. And then they will say, which doll looks like you? And then they will look at both dolls and then she would pick up the black doll. And then she would say, and then they would say, which doll is the bad doll? They will pick up the, the black doll. Which doll is the um, is the stupid doll? And they would pick up the black doll. So clearly what they're doing, and they did this on a number of different kids to show that segregation was creating these negative views, black children having these negative views about themselves. Um, and then this was used to actually desegregate public schools. This was a, um, a study, a psychological study that was used to desegregate public schools to say that segregation was harmful to black children. Well, a lot of white people believe critical race theory can be something similar. And that critical race theory makes white people feel bad about themselves. It makes them say, wow, look at what we've done to people of color, to Native Americans, to black people, to, Latin, to Latinx people, what we have done to Asian Americans. And not just have done, but what this, country that I pledge allegiance to that I'm proud of continues to do to all of these groups. Um, and then it makes them feel bad. It makes them hate themselves. It makes them have lower self-esteem. And we don't want to make white kids feel this way. We don't want to make white people feel this way. And while there has not been any evidentiary research uh, to suggest that this is what happens, like it was with, uh, with the doll test, and Kenneth and Mamie Clark were both, you know, renowned psychologists. So they, they knew what they were doing when they was doing this examination. This was not, uh, I've never seen any research to suggest that critical race theory has the same effect on white people. But what people believe is that when we are teaching that America is inherently racist, that America has these racist foundations, that America is systemically racist, that people of color are still not treated um, in the same regard and with the same um, um, equal and have same e equal opportunities as white people. All of these different, um, all of these different um, assertions, then it could have that same effect, right, on on white people and on white students. And so. The attack on critical race theory was a response to the Black Lives Matter protests last summer. So we all know, uh, and a lot of people, particularly in your generation, um, was very much influenced by those protests. And it seems like every generation, there's something that is done to jolt or to move uh, a generation into action or to remind them of the, um, the social consequences that exist for, uh, for black people, for women, for other people of color, for um, um, homo negative, um, sorry, the LGBTQ uh, community and all these various communities, there's something that reminds us of the world in which we live in. And I know, let's say in, in, in the generation around my generation or before was the, uh, 92 at LA riots, that was a big one with the, the beating of Rodney King, or you may have, um, for some people, it was 
the killing of uh, Sean Bell or Jenna Six, where nooses were being placed on these high school campuses. Um, for a lot of people, you all probably remember this more so than the other things I just said was Trayvon Martin and the killing of Trayvon Martin. You know, I was in my 20s then, but that absolutely jolted a uh, generation and inspired the Black Lives Matter movement. And I think the, the killing of George Floyd absolutely did the same thing, particularly for your generation. And so as a response to uh, the movement and the consciousness being raised, uh, not just Black people, but Black people, white people, Asian people, um, Latinx people, like people of all um, groups and walks of lives and, and gay people, straight people, um, differently able people um, who are all seeing that there are real systemic issues in our, in our country. Um, the response to that from the other side is saying, well, we may not necessarily agree on everything you're saying and the theories that you all are using and putting in our kids to get them to feel the same way is critical race theory. This is the academic engine. This is what you're using to help push this liberal agenda. And we have to stop this. And so in order for us to stop this, we're going to attack how you're trying to teach this to our children. We're going to attack this theory. Um, but what's important for us to realize is that if you really love something or someone, then you can't not assess it and assess it comprehensively and be honest about it, right? Um, one, of my, one of my mentors, she's a, um, a religious um, and race scholar herself, Dr. Ifa McQuasey, um, says, and she was more so looking, looking at this within a religious context, but I believe it, it applies to many aspects of, of social, social thought. And that is that you can't be an uncritical lover, nor can you be an unlo unloving critic of something that you care about, right? Um, if you have love for your country, if you have love for your partner, if you have love for your career, if you have love for your family, if you have love for anything or anyone, you cannot be an uncritical lover and that you see something that you love and that you care about. And so because you care about it, you say everything they do is good. And we don't know one person or one institution where everything that they do is positive. And that's good unless you believe in like a higher power or God or whatever it is you believe in. There are these perfect beings um, that people believe are you know, good, Jesus, God, Allah, Jehovah, Buddha, you know, whatever you believe in. Um, but outside of that, most people um, would say that, you know, people are flawed. People make mistakes. That's a common adage, right? Most people make, you know, people make mistakes. So you can't be an uncritical lover in that you have to critically analyze and, 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 and criticize something that you love. But then you also cannot be an unloving critic. You can't criticize people so much that you don't show love and compassion for them, right? So if you have a partner, and this is typically good to use a romantic <laughs> approach, because everybody, you know, most people want to be in a romantic relationship or like romance or like to be loved or love someone. Um, and so with someone that you want to be with, you would want them to call you out if you're doing something wrong or help you become a better person and not just tell you that you're good all the time and nothing is wrong with you. You would want them to do that. At the same time, you would not want someone to crit criticize you all the time and they're always criticizing you when it's not from a loving place. It's not from a place of wanting to see you do better, but it's from a place of constant criticism. And so this is the way in which critical race theory, I believe, looks at the United States. I believe a lot of critical race theorists um, maybe not all, but many of them, many sociologists, have a love for America, right? Um, have a love for America, have a love for the people, all people in, in the United States, has a love for what America 
has brought to certain people as well as to the rest of the world. However, if you love it, then you have to criticize it and you have to be honest about its history. At the same time, it's out of that love that you do bring that criticism because a person loves the country, right? Because a person loves America. It, and I believe that most, a lot of those scholars and the theory itself does just that. I think a good example is Dr. King. Dr. King had a, a strong love for the United States. He had a strong love for democracy. He had a strong love for the history of the country. At the same time, he was not afraid to speak out against what the country was doing to its own people as well as globally. So critical race theory, now that we've kind of broken down what it's not and what it's not doing, um, we can now go into what it actually is. And it is, it is a specific set of principles and theories that help engage other racial theories of particular time periods within the US context and whatever is going on socially within the US context. So critical race theory is not just one theory and we're gonna go into that in a second. But there are other theories around critical race theory other theories that come under the umbrella of critical race theory. And so when someone says, do you participate in critical race theory? Do you, if, if, you, um, if you use black feminist thought, that's part of critical race theory. If you use systemic racism, that's part of critical race theory. If you talk about intersectionality, that's part of critical race theory. So all of these ideas are part of critical race theory, and then there are other principles and theories that come under it, and we'll talk about what those principles are in a second. Also, critical race theory uses class and gender, and it completes the main set of three oppressed social groups that are used to help explain the realities of a majority of people in this country. So while you have uh, feminism, which helps us to understand um, gender, and you have things like um, Marxism, capitalism, um, which helps us to understand class. You have critical race theory, which helps us understand race. And then it is used to help bring together or provide that you know, triage of theoretical frameworks to help us understand those three main groups in sociology, race, class, and gender. <clears throat> so critical race theory, we've talked about this before in a, in a previous, um, in a previous uh, lecture, so I won't go into the, the details again, but critical race theory essentially comes out of the legal scholarship that forced scholars to have a critical analysis of race and racism, all right? We talked about those people and we talked about where it came from and all of that. But I do want to remind you of the tenets. And those tenets were number one, critical race theory recognizes that racism is a part of the fabric of American society. It will not allow America to escape its racist foundation unless it chooses to rid itself of its racist foundation. And so far, the United States has not decided to do that. In fact, the fact that many people disagree or want to deny that lets us know that we are a long way from being separated from the racist foundation. The fact of the matter is that critical race theory says that racism is at the very core of who America is. And if people want to deny that, um, then they would deny that slavery is a main part of the American story. It's how the United States got so rich is how the U.S. came to be. Um, you can't, uh, you can't, you can't undo that. You can't separate the United States from slavery, from Jim Crow, from the Three Fifths Compromise, from the Fugitive Slave Act, from um, the fact that a majority of presidents prior to the Civil War owned African people and participated in the slave trade. The fact that most universities particularly in the South, were founded and was built off of slave labor. Um, so all of these things are reasons 
why critical race theorists say racism is a part and ingrained in this in the system and in the very fabric of who and what America is. Uh, the individual racist need not exist to know that institutional racism is pervasive in the dominant culture. And so we've talked about that before, where many people believe that racism is an individual thing, and it's not. You, if we could magically get rid of all the races, not get rid of, like kill, but if we could magically change the minds of all, of every person who was considered to be racist in the United States, it does not necessarily mean that everybody would be treated equally. Because racism is not just in the people, it's in the practices of our institutions. It's not just in the people, it's in the way in which our criminal justice system is set up, the way in which our banking system is set up, the way in which our hospitals are set up, the way in which all of these different um, avenues of social life, all of these different institutions are set up in a way to advance white people and that oftentimes disadvantage, whether consciously or subconsciously, people of color. Power structures are based on white privilege and white supremacy, which perpetuates the marginalization of people of color. And so every power structure, economically, politically, socially, um, psychologically, are based on what is best for white people. Right? Even if you look at sociology, the foundation of sociology was put in place to help us understand what is best for white people. Not until Du Bois comes along and says, hey, uh, there's a whole nother group that is a part of the foundation of this country that you're leaving out. And it took him decades for many sociologists to say, oh, yeah, that's right. Even Weber himself says, I completely missed that. And Weber starts to incorporate race more into his analysis as later on in his career. And so again, most of our institutions, even our liberal ones, even our liberal ideas like sociology still have a power structure that is based on what, it, what privileges white people. Critical race theory rejects traditions of liberalism and meritocracy. It says that people are not solely successful off of their merit. Again, not to say that people did not work hard to get where they, where they are. It's not to say that Jeff Bezos didn't work hard or um, Mark Zuckerberg didn't work hard or um, who else? Steve Jobs or whoever, who's a good trillionaire. But it's to say that the fact that they're white and that they're male also help, well, is Jeff Bezos white? I don't know, um, but male for sure. <laughs> um, but there are these privileges that one has, and these many of these people came from upper middle class backgrounds. They weren't, they didn't come from billionaire backgrounds, but upper middle class backgrounds that allow for them to be able to make decisions and make mistakes and come across something that could change the world. So it's not just about your merit; it's also about what privileges you have. And so Kimberly Crenshaw, the person who is uh, this critical race theorist, who actually came up with the term intersectionality, which is something we're going to talk about later, she describes intersectionality. Um, she was a, a civil rights activist. She's a UCLA law professor in critical race theory who helps use intersectionality to help us understand what is critical race theory. And it is out of our understanding of intersectionality that we get the larger concept about what critical race theory does. So I, I want you to watch that and we'll actually come back to this link in a second. But go ahead and watch that, uh, pause this, and then when you unpause, we'll talk more about critical race theory. So what are the purposes of, of CRT? Number one, CRT advances social justice ideas. It is aimed at, it is aimed to even out social inequalities. So the purpose of critical race theory is to very easily, very simple, promote equality, make things equal, bring about justice. Not just talk about it, not just say what's wrong, but call out the wrong, honestly, truthfully, and fairly, and sometimes in a way that's awkward and uncomfortable, so that we can actually get to what is right and do what is right. 
And the way in which that is done is by being honest and sometimes for people to feel uncomfortable. And for sometimes um, for people to um, be knocked off of their uh, levels of, of familiarity. And that's okay, because that's how we grow, right? Uh, another purpose of CRT is to study the intersections between different groups of minorities. So it's not just about the minority group and the majority group and black people and white people or Latinx people and white people, but also the intersections between different groups of minorities. So black people and Latinx people, Asian people and Native Americans, or within the group themselves, middle-class Asian Americans and working-class Asian Americans, poor Latinx people and rich Latinx people, uh, black women and black men. So these intersections within the race are also important. And then critical race theory uh, pays very close attention to mass media and popular culture and how they participate in this distribution of power, how they participate in the perception of minorities, how these bigger uh, uh, mediums uh, perpetuate the inequality or how they can be used to help bring about social justice and social equality, right? So these are the things that critical race theory is supposed to do. And so the questions that we focus on when we're talking about critical race theory, and this is just kind of, again, a really basic idea, something you can even share with your you know, family members or friends when you're having these discussions, um, bite-sized you know, things, we're not even going super, super deep. I didn't give you all a really in-depth article to read about it. Uh, but just you know, to have these overall questions, critical race theory says, is what is happening good for people of color? We don't say colored people. I've said this before, I'll, I'll say this again as well. Colored people is not the correct term. That is a more a pejorative term now uh, than it was about 50 or 60 years ago. You probably still hear people say colored people, but calling um, people of color colored is not um, correct. So people of color is a more appropriate term. Some people, well, that's more appropriate than saying color people. So is this good for people of color, whatever it is, whether it's an ad, whether it's a, um, a song, whether it's um, a show, whether it's an article, whether it's a, a word, um, what a, a policy. That's the first question we ask as critical race theorists. Sexual, second one is how does this portray people of color? So through this policy, through this ad, through this song, through this commercial, through this book, through this piece of art, how are people of color portrayed? And then when people come away from that display, what conclusions can be made about people of color when they come from it, right? What conclusions are drawn? Are there positive conclusions? Are there negative conclusions? So these are the things that critical race theorists look at when they are analyzing something, right? Doing some kind of content analysis, looking again, looking at shows or movies or whatever, ads, commercials, billboards, magazines. And then lastly, now what other intersectional identities can you find in this thing and what does it mean? So how is it not just about race, but how does class play a role in whatever is being presented? How does gender playing a role in whatever is being presented? How does um, religion, how does educational status, how do all of these things play a role in whatever is being presented? These are the main questions that we ask as critical race theorists. So let's put this, let's do an example, right? Um, this is a, an ad <coughs> of some freeze candy uh, in the 1920s. And I want you to look at this advertisement, all right? And in looking at this advertisement, I want you to answer these four questions, these four focus questions that we look at when we're practicing and, and applying critical race theory. Number one, 
Is this ad good for people of color? Looking at this, do you think this is a, a good ad for people of color? And I think most of you would say no, right? No, doesn't look good. Even if a person may not know why, even if a person doesn't know the history of blackface or the history of racial stereotypes, even if you've never seen the movie Bamboozled, um, even if you've never, you know, gone on YouTube and just typed in blackface historical something and looked at the history of blackface and the big, big lips and the lipstick around these black artists and that perpetuate these, these negative views, even if you don't know the history of it. Just looking at it is like, mm, I don't, that just doesn't feel good. <laughs> just doesn't look good for me. I don't even know why, it just doesn't. So then the next question is, how does this portray people of color? If you're looking at this person, what do they look like? And if we look at this, we see that it is portraying this black child with this very, first of all, they don't look attractive. There's nothing exciting, cute. It's a child, but it's not a cute child. These nappy hairs just kind of sticking out. Um, these exaggerated features of the lipstick and these very huge eyes. Uh, that look very funny and almost kind of scary. These old, the overly dark skin tone of the child, again, very exaggerated, very elaborated. It's not giving uh, an accurate portrayal of what Black people, uh, of what a lot of Black people look, would look like. Um, then you have this watermelon um, here, and that has oftentimes been used as a way of promoting ignorance for black people saying that black people love chicken and they love watermelon. And so whenever we see negative images of black people that are dehumanizing or that are not upright or respectable, oftentimes they are smiling, laughing, dancing, eating watermelon, eating chicken, sleeping, or you know, just kind of running around being unintelligent and, and uncouth, right? Um, that is the idea. And so it, that gets perpetuated in this ad of, neg of negativity right, about Black people. Um, so Black people are portrayed as infantile, as ignorant, as greedy, as uncivilized. What conclusions seem to be made about people of color in this? Those same conclusions that this is who they are, this is what they are. And it's funny, a person might look at this, especially during that time and say, ha, ah, look at the funny looking black baby. That's hilarious. What's that, five cents? I'll spend five cents on this. Because it makes people of color look bad, particularly black people. And then it makes, and then inadvertently that makes white people feel good. Even if you're a poor white person, even a poor white person who can't even afford the five cents may look at that and make themselves, it makes them feel good because it makes them say, ooh, I'm poor, but at least I'm not this black person. And that's called the psychological wage of whiteness. I think we talked about that. The boys calls this the psychological wage of whiteness. And so that's what, that is the conclusion that comes out of this image. And then what other intersectionalities, race, gender, class, ethnicity, can you find and what do they mean? Um, we don't know if that's a boy or a girl. I guess it's a girl because this little girl has a bow. Um, so you have that aspect of it, a little black girl not pretty, right? Not like a cute baby that you would say, oh, look at the cute child. It's ugly, right? 
So it promotes the the ugliness, the the these the opposite of beauty standards for white people. If this is the epitome of being ugly, then we want the exact opposite for beauty, right? So these other, I don't know if we really see class or sexuality in it. Um, maybe you can. Um, I'm just kind of looking, but if you do, feel free to you know to talk about that. But we can see that in this ad. What you all just did was critical race theory. But you all answering those questions is what critical race theorists do all the time. Uh, you're doing it. And so if you decide to use critical race theory for your theoretical framework, theoretical analysis paper, um, absolutely, you know, this is helping you to do that. Um, yes. All right, so let's, um, it's clear, right, that if we go to something from the 1920s, it's like, well, Professor Grant, I mean, that's low hanging fruit. You know, we know people were racist back then. Um, but these types of ads don't exist now. Well, let's look at a more recent ad. Uh, I want you to take a look at this advertisement. Um, I don't know exactly what year it came out, but it was uh, uploaded to YouTube about four years ago. Um, and it's definitely much more recent than the 1920s. So even if it came out in the past 10 years or so, um, check this ad out and tell me what you think. So after looking at this ad, <clears throat> um, and going through those same questions. Number one, the ad isn't even in English. And I did that on purpose. Because I want us to see how racism is not just in the US context. Racism transcends the US context. Right? And so even on a global scale, critical race theory is important. Because we, m many of us may not even know the language that they're speaking. But we can still see, based on the storyline, this is all right. So is this good for people of color? Doesn't feel like it. And it's not even Black people, African Americans necessarily, or people who, we, who would be considered part of the African diaspora. <laughs> But regardless, these people of color, is this good for them? Doesn't feel like it. I don't think I'm a part of that racial group. It wasn't said what their racial group was, but I wouldn't feel good watching that. I don't feel good watching. And I especially wouldn't feel good if I was a part of that racial group. How does this portray people of color? It says that the lighter you are, the worse your life is. People may not like you or want to be around you. You may not be as successful. But if you change your color, if you lighten your color, now all of a sudden the love interest is looking at you. You're walking straighter and you're walking taller. Your dad appreciates you more. And life is better. Life is just better for white people. Or if you cannot be white, the lighter you are. And so what conclusions seem to be made about people of color? If you're a person of color, you're not going to be considered beautiful. You won't have the good job. Not because of something wrong with society, because of your color. You inherently are the reason why these opportunities do not exist for you. Goes back to what Du Bois said, how does it feel to be the problem? That's what this commercial is perpetuating. You're the problem because you're dark skin. If you lighten that skin, if you get our product and you lighten that skin, watch how good your life is gonna be. And that's the conclusion that's being made. 
in this very modern ad. What intersectionalities can you find and what do they mean? Obviously, gender is in there clear, especially for women. You want to get that man, you want to get that partner, lighten your skin. If you notice when she was walking and the guy kind of looked at her, oh, she was gorgeous, she's beautiful. Right? Sexuality, you're more available to a partner. And then in being more available to a partner, you increase your opportunities of marriage, class mobility, um, having a beautiful and more, fu more fulfilled life. Because now you're married, now you have children, now you are doing what you're supposed to do in life as a woman. So you can find out what that means when you lighten your skin. And so, again, we see that heat, critical race theory. This is what we're doing. This is how we're looking at how racial ideas and racialized practices within our country has caused um, or perpetuates or reinforces race and racism. Okay. So, um, Again, I know you all know about critical race theory. A lot of you do, some of you may not, but this is again, just an introduction and critical race theory is very broad. You, there are whole classes taught on critical race theory. So we, you know, well, I just kind of wanted to give you that introduction and also have us look at the other side. And if you now, if you have those conversations, you can have something to bring to that conversation by saying, hey, this is what it's not, this is what it is. And this is why this is necessary. Because now when we see these kind of ads, see these kind of portrayals of people of color, we can call it out and we can be honest about it and know that we can do better. We can be better. We can be at a critical lover and a loving critic of the society that you care for. Now, critical race theory, like I said before, going to the next slide, is not just one theory, but it is an umbrella of theories. So systemic racism, Black feminist thought, intersectionality are all a part of critical race theory. And critical race, and so Kimberly Crenshaw, you probably uh, looked at that link already, came up with the notion of intersectionality in 1989, but she did not invent intersectionality. Intersectionality is not new. Intersectionality is, we already talked about that, it goes all the way back to Ain't I, I a Woman, Sojourn the Truth. Right? And I'm pretty sure we could even go back further than that. If we were to look at some feminist writings way before the United States was even thought about. But the term intersectionality, Kimberly Crenshaw did come up with that term and now that's been popularized and what it is is that it describes how gender and race and class and all these other factors how it plays a role in the oppression of an individual so it says that we are not just one thing i'm not just black i'm black i'm a male i will be considered middle class educated from the South, right? Religious to some degree, somewhat, right? So all of these identifying factors make up who I am. And so if, I, if someone was to just do a racial analysis or a class analysis or a gender analysis, they're missing these other parts. But we are all these different things from the United States, English speaking, either heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, whatever. All of these things make up who we are. We are intersectional beings. Intersectional feminism is this form of feminism that views women's identities as more than just women. So if you identify as a woman in this class, you're more than a woman. 
You may be a black woman. You may be a white woman. You may be Latina. You may be an Asian woman. You may be a native woman. You may be a gay woman, a straight woman, right? You may come from a poor background, a middle-class background, an upper middle-class background. You may be a Christian, a Muslim, a Buddhist. All these different things make up who you are. English may be your first language or your second language. But intersectionality makes sure that all women are included and that women are not left out or forgotten. Even in critical race theory, when it first came out, people were excited, but it was only talking about men, black men specifically. And it was only studying and talking about the interests and, and, and what was important to black men. And that's when Kimberly Crenshaw had to say, hey, wait a minute, y'all leaving out black women and added that intersectional approach to say, if we're gonna talk about critical race theory, we're not going to recreate what's already being done in, sociology, in white sociology, which is forgetting about white women. If we're gonna do this, we need to include women of color in this. And not just women of color, but non-binary people of color. That was not as popular of a concept then it is now, but now including non-binary people of color. Now we want to expand this so that people are not left out and people's experiences are not left out. And so when we talk about critical race theory and particularly intersectionality, it is absolutely important that we go back to the originators. When we talked about Sojourner Truth Ain't Our Woman as, as part of the originator of <clears throat> intersectionality and Black feminist thought, and, but the woman who really pushed that forward in this academic way and gave us the foundation for it was Anna Julia Haywood Cooper. She was born in 1858 in North Carolina. And she was an author, she was uh, an educator, she was a sociologist. She believed in black liberation and one of the foremost African-American scholars in the United States. And she was born into slavery in North Carolina. But she had some privileges um, that allowed for her to get a world-class education. And if you want to, you know, go on, I'm, <clears throat> I won't go into all the details, but you, you can if you want to. But she was, uh, she was able to have some privileges because of who she was connected to and who so-called owned her when she was born into slavery and she was able to get a world-class education. And she became very powerful and prestigious in her academic and social circles. Not only that, when she was asked to prove herself, she proved to be so much smarter than her black colleagues and her white colleagues. She would go on to tutor them, she would go on to be a teacher and then eventually she would get her PhD in history from the University of Paris and became the fourth African-American woman to earn a doctoral degree, the other one being Eva B. Dykes and two others. Um, she went on to you know, do incredible work, uh, but one of the things that she did that contributes to what we're talking about was she wrote this book that advanced the vision of self-determination through education um, and promoted social uplift for African-American women. And the point of this book, the thesis of this book was that educational, moral, and spiritual progress of Black women would improve the overall standing of the African-American community and overall improve the standing of, the, um, of American society. And this was something that not only he, um, not only she, a strategy that she used, but Frederick Douglass used as well when we look at what did the slave is the 4th of July. If you bring up black folks, you bring up America. And Anna Julia Cooper is saying, takes it a step further. Listen, if you bring up black women, you bring up black folks and then you bring up America. And that's her overall idea. We're gonna break that down in a second with just the chapter that you, that you read. And she talks about how the violent nature of men, the exploitative nature of men, 
often goes counter to the goals of what higher education is supposed to be, of what critical analysis is supposed to be. And so it is women that will bring that elegance, that compassion to education, that compassion to this new America. And this is at the end of the 19th century. So bringing it into the new century. And a lot of people criticized Anna Julia Cooper felt that she was telling women to be submissive in the 19th century. But other people looked at what she was saying as being important, particularly for black feminism. And Anna Julia Cooper advanced this view that it was the duty of educated and successful black women to support the underclass, to support the working class to achieve their goals. And so this group of essays, A Voice from the South, touched on a variety of topics about race and about racism and gender and socioeconomic realities of Black people. And she also talked, uh, touched on the church as well, the Christian church, the Episcopal church, more specifically. And Again, this goes to the point where she would be considered, because of this work, the mother of Black feminism. Because of this work of Voice from the South. And she argued that women did so much for the United States. She goes down a list. She says, she stops and says, it's just too much. I, I can't even continue because women have done so much for the development of the United States. What, what's the point of even going down the list, though? Because so far, it seems like the country that this country that's being ran by men is only focusing on wealth producing. How can we make more money? And obviously, we know this is coming out of a very strong time in American history. What time are we talking about? You should know we've discussed it several times, this time period. This is the Industrial Revolution the birth of big cities, urbanization, globalization, factories, the mechanization of society. This is where you get big cities like Chicago, Atlanta, Charlotte, New York, birth of Hollywood coming out of LA late 19th, early 20th century, Vegas. And so the, the, the country is a wealth producing magnet, but in return for producing wealth for a certain group, it is resulting in slums, poor health, <coughs> and exploitation of black women's bodies at the same time. And so what she's saying is we need women more now than ever before because the, the United States morally is in, a, is in a horrible place. Economically, it's great. Morally and spiritually, it's horrible. This is where you get Max Weber's, uh, Max Weber's um, The Protestant Ethics and the Spirit of Capitalism. Less than 100 years later, Dr. King will say the same thing. America is, is, is rich, but morally and spiritually, it's bankrupt because of what was going on in Vietnam, because, what was, because of what was going on in the inner cities of, of the United States and particularly to black Americans who weren't allowed to vote, live in certain neighborhoods who were being lynched in the South and in the Midwest. So Anna Julia Cooper is saying even in, 18, in the 1890s when this is being written, women's work is more important now than ever before because this country worships the dollar, worships money, worships expansion. <clears throat> so she said, even in the pioneer days, women's role was burdened because it was all about sympathy and love, helping the man clear the wilderness, construct the home, not saying anything. Work, do the work of the man, and then when the man goes to sleep, do the work of the woman. And then in the second part, this wealth producing period, now her work is to be next to the man, complement the man, supplement what the man is not doing 
And now it is important for the woman to counteract all the excessiveness of the men. The fact that men are excessive with monopolies. So this is the era of Rockefeller, of Carnegie, Vanderbilt. This excessive life. If you've ever seen um, The Great Gatsby, this is kind of like the apex of it. This excessive life that Americans are living all the way up until the 1920s and then it comes crashing in the Great Depression. Anna Julia Cooper say it's up to women to bring that balance because these men are out of control. They're spending crazy amounts of money. Just it doesn't make sense. The wealth that is being wasted in spirituality or, or spiritually, we're just and consciously we're, we're in a bad place. So now the women must have the dominant tone. And this nature is supposed to contribute to the world. Women need to be the new, um, the new leaders. Women need to have the moral forces that can bring happiness to the homes and righteousness to the country. And Julia Cooper says something interesting. She says, in a reign of moral ideas, she is easily queen. The woman is easily queen. The woman is easily the leader. And in order for you to bring about a sense of balance and righteousness and leadership that is more moral, you have to put women at the forefront. You have to support women. Then she goes on to say, but specifically, you need to support Black women. Because she says, while the women of the, right, of the white race can get the assurance from her man, the Black men don't necessarily have that, or the Black women don't necessarily have that from the Black men of her race. Oftentimes, not because they don't want to give it, but because the Black men are fighting their own battles. And so she says that the colored woman has this different and unique position in the country. She is able to see things from this racial and this gender perspective that oftentimes is not looked at and not seen from white people or from black men. And so her status is one that is of the least ascertainable. And it is definitive of all the forces of civilization. She can see the race, the gender and the sexuality and the class. She can see all of it. She's confronted by the woman question and the race question. And so she says that the colored woman should absolutely not be ignored. And it is largely that the women, the black women, particularly the black women in the South, they're the ones that are keeping everything together. She says they're the ones that are keeping black men in the Republican Party. This was during the time where the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln. This was the party that freed the so-called freed the slaves. She says it is the, the women that are putting these ideas in the black men to keep them supporting and voting Republican when they could vote. And as they increase in intelligence and power of discrimination, they would be more apt to divide on local issues at any rate, talking about black men. When they start to see that the GOP, the Republican parties regards the Negroes cause as an outgrown issue. So if you want to remain in power, because she's saying the black men will deviate. If you want to remain in power, you need to focus on Black women. It is the Black women that's keeping the GOP essentially alive. Of course, we know in the 60s, it started to switch, and then more people of color, more specifically Black people, started to vote Democrat because of the, because of the negotiations of the civil rights movement and the Southern strategy. This isn't a history class, so we won't go all into that, but that's when you see the switch.
And so Anna Julia Cooper says that she is always sound and orthodox on questions affecting the well-being of her race. If you want to know and if you want to do what's best for the race, for Black people, ask Black women. Talk to Black women. They know because they're at the bottom of their own race. They're at the bottom of their own race. They're at the bottom of their own gender. They're at the bottom of sexuality and that they cannot express sexuality even in ways that are as free as white, that white women can. So if you want to understand everything, go to black women. That's why they are called what? When we talked about this earlier, the mule of the world. This is what Zora Neale Hurston said. And Alice, I believe it was Alice Walker who said it again some decades later. So the black woman then, that intersectionality is where you will really get the key to truly uplifting the American, American society, truly providing the right amount of moral and spiritual fiber that is necessary to counteract this overwhelming need for wealth and expansion and growth and greed that exists in this mechanized, industrial, urbanized time. And I, I thought this quote was really good going to the next one. She says, yes, Ethiopia shall stretch her bleeding hands abroad. I think this was necessary because I didn't even realize this until I read it, that she was actually the first one to talk about this. And typically we talk, when we read the hands of Ethiopia, we read that early on, Du Bois's work in Dark Water, that was his collection of essays, that, that came out in the 1930s. That came out in the 1930s. This came out in the 1890s. So she was the first one to talk about Ethiopia stretching her hands out. I don't know if Du Bois got it from her because I know she was inspired by Du Bois, but I would probably argue that Du Bois, I would say he probably got it from her. Her cry of agony shall reach the burning throne of God. Talking when she says, yes, Ethiopia. Ethiopia is, is a symbol of, of Africa which is a, this kind of pan-African call for Black people across the diaspora, across the globe, saying that Black people's bleeding hands will, cry, will stretch abroad and it will reach God's throne. And God will redeem the dust from their chains and he's going to lift their eyes and they will triumph. And so when we look at How she ends this, she says, no plan for renovating society, no scheme for purifying politics, no reform in church, no kind of movement upward or forward will be lost if you include women. If you include women, you won't be lost. It will be the secret to your overall success. Clearly, you know how to be successful economically. But to do it all, you need women. And then she says, a man once said, when told his house was on fire, go tell my wife, I never meddle with household affairs. <laughs> See, men are so caught up from being men handling everything on the outside, and even when their lives are burning up, they need the women to keep them afloat, to keep them in line. So you have to empower women. And now we're at a place where women are saying, we demand it, but we're not going to keep doing it. We're tired of asking. And that's a good place to be. And she says, so to be alive at such a time is a privilege to be a woman. That is sublime. It's a privilege to be alive right now as women because now is our time. It's the late 19th century. What a time to be alive. That's an album by Future and Drake. Came out a couple of years ago. What a time to be alive is essentially what she's saying. But then she goes on to say, but to be a Negro woman, 
is even greater because now if you empower not only the woman but the Negro woman, now you empower a group that can that can grapple with the deep significance of the possibilities of this crisis that our country is in. A group that has a heritage and has a meaning that is unique. In the first place, the race is young. Remember Frederick Douglass said, well, he said that about the country, but even about the race as well, this African-American race, she says, we're young, full of movement, full of elasticity. We can be molded, we can be shaped. All its achievements are before it. Anything that you want black people to be able to do, we can do because we're young. Empower us. Help us to empower ourselves and we can take this country to the highest of the heights. Some people may agree with her approach, some people may not, but we have to consider the context in which she's writing. In a post-civil rights, post-Black power, Black Lives Matter era, some people may say, I don't like that. <laughs> That sounds too submissive. And that's one of the things she was critical, critiqued for. But had she talked like how we talk today, I don't even know if this would be published. So this was considered radical for her time. But powerful words. And we can see now why even in, I think, 1895, this was published. How even in the 1890s that this is seen as the foundational work for Black feminism, for intersectionality, and ultimately critical race theory. We see that now. All right, so with that being said, this is it. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this lecture. I've enjoyed our conversations and the, um, and the office hours. If you have any questions about anything, feel free to reach out to me, your email inbox, office hours, and I'll be more than happy to Talk about you, talk about, not talk about you. <laughs> if I talk about you, it'll be to you, but talk about it. And I hope you have a great day, great week, and a great weekend.